Opposite, yes. Sorry, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, we have Ava from Compass Community who will be um, leading the session for us. Um, Ava runs a lot of um, composting sessions for us and she also um, helps, um, is our partner in our um, the Council's Compost Rebate Program. Um, so before I hand it over to Ella, I'm just going to do a quick welcome to country um, and then Ella will um, take us through the rest of the presentation for today. So, the morning to finish the show acknowledges and pays respects to the elders, families and ancestors of the Brahman, Brahman people who have been the custodians of this land for many thousands of years. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet is the place of annual ceremonies, celebrations, initiations and renewal, and that the Brahman, Brahman people's living culture continues to have a unique role in the life of this region. Um, so just a reminder that um, yes, this session is being recorded, so if you would not like um, to be um, on screen while the recording, then uh, please um, feel free to um, turn your video off. Um, and what we'll do is we'll distribute the recording after the session. Is that right, Alan? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. thanks. Um, yes. Over to you. Yes. Thank you. All right. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to do a bit of sharing and a bit of unsharing to show you uh, some examples of things. So we shall begin. Okay, um, this is our dog Jasper and uh, his poo toy. We thought it was a bit more tasteful than showing actual dog poo, but I will give you a quick disclaimer. There may be pictures of dog poo in the presentation. <laughs> um, now, just a bit of housekeeping to begin with. A lot of the questions um, that I know you'll be busting to ask. Oh, that's a squeaky toy. Apologies. I'm going to put that away so that I don't do that again. Um, we will get to your questions at the end um, because what we find is the questions actually do get answered uh, a little bit further in, on in the presentation and because we do only have an hour for the presentation, um, yeah, we just, to, to keep it tight, we'll just hold off those questions but pop them in the chat, um, the chat function, then anything, you don't have to then try to remember your questions uh, and then anything that uh, we haven't covered in the Prezo, we can make sure that we do get to for you. And if it's something I don't know the answer for, uh, it's certainly something I will look up and find out for you. Um, of course, stay on mute during the presentation. Um, I've got a little person in the background here, but hopefully she's distracted enough with Netflix to not make too much noise. Um, and oops, just someone else in the waiting room. Um, and we'll make this recording available as well um, after the session uh, and also the slides. I can send a PDF of the slides to Amy to distribute as well. Um, and there's some links at the end to some free resources. Um, we've got a really handy Facebook group too that, um, yeah, is a really good spot to, to ask just random questions about various areas of composting and um, a whole community of people that can give you different spins and different experiences on it. So you're not just hearing it from me. I'm just going to do a quick poll if it works. Okay, launch polling. Hopefully you can all see this poll. Just want to get a bit of a sense of what, um, you know, what, what sorts of animals you're interested in learning about composting the poop for, because um, obviously I've geared this session mostly towards dogs and cats. Um, and I know I use dogs as an example um, a lot, but um, yeah, just want to make sure that I'm not leaving out something like rabbits and guinea pigs. Shh, sweetie, I'm in a meeting. Um, so that's everybody. What I might do, I might just, shh, sweetie. I might just leave this poll open for just a minute and end polling. I have got a sound filter on that hopefully is filtering out that background noise. All right, I think that's everybody. So I'll just end polling. So Cat Poo was the winner. Um, I'll just share the results so you can all see them. And I'll download them as well. Um, okay, so that is polling saved. So I will stop sharing the results or you can actually press the little button to close them on your screen. Now, I am hoping that 
you are still seeing the presentation. Can anyone give me a, um, a shout out if it's showing a different screen? Oh, yep, still presentation, great. Okay. Um, so what we're gonna cover today, um, as I mentioned, it sort of, it, it does seem heavily geared towards dogs, but we're looking at dogs and cats mostly today. We're gonna look at why compost pet poo, um, so the benefits of it, um, types of course, um, but we'll, again, again, we'll focus on those carnivorous kind of pets and omnivores. Um, we'll look at some of the risks and warnings, particularly with cats, um, but just in general, because obviously safety is very important and um, it would be a really, real shame for someone to get sick. Uh, we'll look at some of the different options, so different ways that you can compost pet poo. Um, there's more than one system that you can use um, and there's lots of things you can make as well. Um, then, of course, we'll look at some of the fundamentals, um, you know, composting principles, because you still need to use them when you're composting pet poo. Um, we'll look at some pet specific considerations, um, where to get supplies, other resources, and of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so why compost pet poo? I think most of you are probably here for, for the same reason. Um, you know, it's, it can smell, we hate stepping in it, um, we hate throwing it out, you know, throwing stuff to landfill creates greenhouse gas emissions. A couple of other things that people don't probably think of as much is um, pet poo, particularly dog and cat poo, is very high in nitrogen. Um, and that can create pollution. Um, so as that, you know, as that breaks down in the soil and washes down into the groundwater or into the local creek, um, it takes with it pathogens and things like that, as well as nitrogen and other nutrients, which cause excess plant growth and weed growth, and of course, potential algal blooms in waterways. And of course, if we're picking it up, we're not stepping in it. Um, so, People sort of say, oh, but you know, it's not really worth just cleaning up after one dog or one cat. Um, I don't actually have the, the amount of how much cat poo is produced by the average cat in a year. Um, but judging by my cat, it's a fair bit. <laughs> Fortunately, she seems to go in the sink lately. So <laughs> at least it's easy to collect. Um, I'm not having to use so much kitty litter. Um, so yeah, it, it does build up over time. It's quite significant. So. Uh, you know, you sort of think just picking up after one dog, if you were to convert that into greenhouse gas emissions or something else, it's a really big impact we can have by composting that rather than throwing it out to landfill or leaving it in the environment. So um, this is where we get down into the nitty gritty of the poo. <laughs> and that is that not all poo is created equal. We are dealing today mostly with dog and cat poo, which is more hazardous than something like, say, horse poo. So poo from herbivores tends to be lower in various pathogens, but it still can have funguses, fungi, um, bacteria, and so forth in it, whereas dog and cat poo have a lot more pathogens in it that can be transferred to us as humans um, and that can be transferred into our environment and be dangerous. So we want to think about safety when we're composting pet poo. Um, so we'll look at where it's safe to, uh, to use composted pet poo and where it's not. Um, so some of the main sort of bacteria and pathogens to think about when we're looking at the pet poo is E. coli, um, fecal coliform, salmonella and giardia. Um, I think it's pronounced giardia. Um, I've had that once from drinking water from a creek out well, from a billabong and um, it's not fun. So <laughs> um, we certainly don't want to be putting ourselves in a situation where that leachate from compost is draining to somewhere where we might actually be drinking that water or maybe where kids play. So if you've got, you know, lower lying land um, in your backyard, you might want to think about where you position your compost system so that it's not having leachate going to an area that forms puddles. Um, the risks of some of these things, you know, from as simple as gastro, which isn't always simple, um, to blindness. There's a girl in the UK that um, that actually lost the sight in one eye because of pathogens linked to dog poo. So um, yes, you want to obviously be safe. Uh, of course, hookworm, roundworm, tapeworm, all those 
sorts of worms, um, pathogens you want to think about as well. And toxoplasmosis is specifically with cats. Toxoplasmosis is a pathogen that uh, can cause birth defects. Um, so it's really, really dangerous for pregnant women to be around. Uh, really anyone of breeding age um, or reproductive age, I should say. I'm dealing with animals all the time with <laughs> breeding age, but reproductive age, um, something to think about. So know that when you're picking up your pet poo, you're potentially picking up all these different bacteria and pathogens. So you want to be safe, um, use gloves and uh, compost in a way that you're not then going to be spreading these pathogens around the garden. Um, and so people say, well, you know, there's some websites say you shouldn't compost pet poo. It's too risky because it's full of all these pathogens. You know what? It's pretty risky if it's just left in the garden as well. So um, my my philosophy is let's let's compost it, but let's compost it safely. Let's pick it up so it's not out in the environment, um, but compost it in such a way that we're not then passing that risk on to another part of the garden or to another part of our families. So in terms of managing that risk, safe handling, um, obviously, you know, wearing gloves is a simple thing. Um, a lot of people when they're out walking their dogs will use bags. These are compostable bags here. Um, so we'll talk about bags soon because bags um, can be problematic. Um, pooper scooper like this. Get up. So just, yeah, obviously, not touching poo. Common sense for most people. Oh, it's okay, sweetie. <laughs> it's common sense to most people, but you know, you might be, um, you might have kids that are following you and watching you, and um, you know, monkey see, monkey do. What you do, they'll do. So if you demonstrate safe handling, they'll copy. Um, of course, think too about breathing in pathogens if it's sort of dry and and got you know obvious mildew and that type of thing on it as well, because those spores can be dangerous. Um, another way to manage risk is having an in-ground system. So rather than having a compost system or a worm farm that's above ground that you then harvest the compost from or the castings from and use somewhere in the garden, having a permanent system that's really just a poo waste disposal method means really limited handling. So um, I'm going to show you some systems. I'll unshare for just a sec. Um, this here is an example of an in-ground system. So essentially what you do is you dig a hole and you bury, so you just have the neck out, like from here out of the soil and the rest in the ground and it's just got the lid. Um, so you can just pop your pet poo in and basically not have to ever dig it up. Um, so what you add in a system like that is either worms or Bakashi. Bakashi is, thank you darling, look I've just been brought a lovely little set of food that will also have some scraps for the compost. One thing that I will touch on a bit later is you don't want to compost just pet poo on its own, you need some other ingredients to kind of make it happen, to, to do the magic. Um, think of it like making a cake, you need your wet and your dry ingredients. When you're composting pet poo, you need some other ingredients just to help keep things going. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is called Bakashi. This one, this particular one's called en Enso Pet. To be honest, it's identical to Bakashi grain. Um, what it is, it's a um, fermenting activator that is in a dormant state on a carbon rich material. So whether it's a, a grain or fiber um, and you sprinkle that into a compost system and that starts the fermentation process, it has about 80 different microbes or it activates into 80 different microbes that um, are kind of like probiotics that really help the soil and everything in the soil start to break things down. So that's, that's something that you can use in addition to or instead of worms. Um, or you can compost really hot, but we'll talk about that shortly. <laughs> um, another option, this is called a compost cannon. I don't know if you can even buy these anymore. This is basically a car cardboard tube uh, with holes in it. So um, think about, you know, you might have some polytube laying around at home. Drill some holes in the polytube, dig a hole, pop it in the ground, uh, and then just pop, say, a terracotta lid or something over the top, um, just so that yeah, you know, birds and dogs and 
flies <laughs> don't cause a bit of a problem. And um, yeah, you can pop your, your dog poo in something like that as well. So um, having something permanently in the ground is um, certainly a way to reduce that risk. Um, keep it well away from growing any food. So whilst you will be breaking down a lot of these pathogens and things, um, something like salmonella, Salmonella or E. coli um, could end up in your veggies that you grow um, and you don't want to be eating, you know, a lettuce that then gives you gastro. So um, have it well away from anywhere that you grow food, um, including fruit trees. I would, as a preference, I would not use it near fruit trees. I do have a rosemary bush near one spot that I compost pet poo, um, but we don't use the rosemary uncooked. So. Uh, look, that, that's a bit risky maybe, but of course, of course, use your own judgment of what you're comfortable with, um, but I would prefer not to use any pet poo in any food growing. Um, of course, keep it well away from waterways. Um, that includes storm water. So um, whilst, you know, a lot of people are on suburban blocks, you sort of think, oh, you're not really in a waterway, you're not really near a waterway or a creek. Um, but all the stormwater drains, including off your roof, um, along the gutters, they all flow into local creeks. So whatever goes into those spaces go into local creeks. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about it. Yes, I can't help you right now, darling. Um, so if you're using compost, my little screen's in the way, I can't even see my, um, <laughs> my notes. Um, if you are composting, so a traditional compost, whether it's in a compost bin or a compost heap or a compost bay, you want it to be hot. You want it to be at that stage where it's steaming. If it's not steaming, you're not killing the pathogens. So that hot compost is how you can kill those pathogens. And then you could use that compost you know, in food growing and all those other things. Um, it's very difficult to achieve a, a really good hot compost, um, particularly in a suburban kind of situation because you just don't have the space. Um, but, you know, if you're a, a compost master, we've got someone coming to the next session on Tuesday who is an absolute compost master. Um, he, he might be able to give us some good tips on composting hot in small spaces. The other thing you want to do is keep your worms alive. If you are running an in-ground worm farm and you worm your dog, <laughs> you're going to kill your worms. Um, so wormers, uh, I say dog, I should say dog and cat because I know there's a big focus on cats today. Um, dog and cat wormers, they kill worms, all sorts of worms, um, including compost worms. So definitely keep in mind, um, a thing called a withholding period. So when uh, it'll often say on the packet, oh, it might not for domestic pets, but if you're buying a like a livestock one, it'll tell you how long until um, refuse from that animal is safe, safe um, for the environment. <coughs> with um, with dog and cat wormers, generally about ten days but it'll be different depending on the active ingredient. So just keep that in mind. You might wanna have a different system um, that doesn't rely on worms for the times that you worm your dog or cat, which for a lot of people is monthly. So that could be 10 days out of every month, <laughs> but it's not working for you. Um, so in terms of options, I've shown you some options already. Um, when we look at the DIY options, um, you'd be familiar with seeing piles of mulch, piles of grass clippings, piles of horse manure, and that steam coming off. That's what you're trying to achieve. You want the steam coming off because that means it's getting to 60 degrees in the core. 60 degrees won't kill every pathogen, but it'll kill the bulk of the pathogens. Um, so that's what you want to achieve. But to do that, you generally need quite a large compost pile, unless you're using some um, quite advanced hot compost techniques um, in terms of adding some really high protein ingredients and so forth, which we won't go into today. It's a whole other topic. Um, so yes, you're definitely wanting to get the steam happening. But alternatively, um, a poly pipe, or as I showed you earlier, um, cardboard tube, some sort of a tube, you could use uh, a terracotta pipe as well. Something like that will work very well um, because you can drill into terracotta really easily. Um, but keep in mind something like terracotta dries out a lot quicker. I tend to try to use food grade plastics um, when I'm doing 
in ground composting just because I don't want leaching into the environment of any EPAs or anything like that. Oh, I've got a little one here who's um, needing me to take her inside, but I'm just going to persist and maybe, can you run in and get daddy? Oh, you just have to hold on, sweetie. We won't be long. Um, so terracotta pots, as I mentioned, um, if you've got a broken terracotta pot, maybe the base has fallen out, that might be a good option. Um, and then in terms of systems you can buy, um, this one's called Enso Pet, which um, I actually, I'll add this to the website later. It's um, a product that I've only just added to the range, but it it's similar to the tumbleweed one that I showed you a moment ago, and it snaps together and sits in the ground. Um, so uh, that one actually comes with tongs and the bakashi mix. So that's a nice little way to ferment straight away. Uh, then you've got the big in ground system, uh, which is like the yard art. I'll show you that one. I'll pop outside um, maybe during question time to show you that system. It was a bit too dirty to bring inside. Uh, ironically, I did have everything set up outside to run the workshop. So it was raining at 11.30 last night. Decided to be safe and move it all inside. And now it's a glorious day with sun everywhere. So Murphy's Law, but I will show you that shortly. Um, then there's things like the worm feast, which is a budget option of an in-ground system. Um, so obviously, you know, not everyone has time to make things or the skills or the tools. So it's great to be able to, you know, whip something, put something together, that just snaps together and, and you're ready to roll within minutes. Um, that's just an illustration of how this system that I showed you a moment ago, um, sort of cross-section looks under the ground. Um, most of it sits under the ground just the lid on top. What else have we got here? If you are using a compost bin, a couple of bits of advice. One, make sure it's a compost bin with a lid um, because I, I do compost pet poo um, under a big deciduous, just deciduous tree where I won't be growing any food. Um, but if that lid is not on, it smells uh, it smells like dog poo. <laughs> so definitely want to have a lidded system and again Thinking about handling handling compost, it's not ideal um, because you're not getting it hot. So when you're handling it, you'll have some pathogens. And then there's other in-ground systems like the subpod, um, which are, are really large scale systems. So um, good if you've got a lot of garden waste as well. It's a little tower. Um, so in terms of some composting fundamentals, it um Sort of seems like, oh yeah, you can bung something in the ground and start to chuck your dog poo in and maybe have some worms or maybe have some bakashi mix and Bob's your uncle. Um, there's a little bit more to it uh, because you need to actually have it functioning as a healthy compost system so that it continues to break down and doesn't just turn into a stinky anaerobic mess. So we have two acronyms, um, Adam and Ant. I was thinking it could be Adam and Nat, but Adam Ant rolls off the tongue. Um, so Adam is an acronym standing for aliveness, uh, aliveness being that it's a living system. So if you lift your lid of your uh, cat poo system or dog poo system um, and see bustling with life, so lots of bugs and spiders and slugs, that's a really good sign. If there's nothing living in there, that's a bad sign. So um, Whilst there's a lot of microorganisms, I know, sweetie, that you can't see, um, it's those things that you can see that are your, um, you know, sort of your litmus test, I suppose, of, of how healthy it is. Diversity is the D of Adam, and that stands for your diversity of ingredients. So um, just adding dog poo alone, it's not going to be very fast. To break down. We tend to group our ingredients into two categories, greens and browns, which when we're talking about dog poo is really misleading. So um, we won't talk about greens and browns, oh, so I should say cat poo as well. Um, with dog and cat poo, generally with food scraps and garden waste, your food scraps are more often than not green or a colour uh, and your garden scraps and dry ingredients are generally brown. Um, and so, but the, the coloured ingredients are wet and the brown ingredients are dry. Um, with dog poo and cat poo, 
It actually falls into the green category because, well, there is a bit of moisture in it, but it's very, very high in nitrogen. And the other feature of our green ingredients is nitrogen rich. So dog poo and cat poo will need to be offset with some brown or dry or carbon rich ingredients. I've got an example here, that deciduous tree I mentioned earlier. Um, that's a really good offset to the dog poo. So just something, or cat poo, um, something like that. I know with a lot of people with your cat poo, you'll probably have um, the recycled uh, newspaper kitty litter. Um, that is a really good offset for the nitrogen, but what you'll find is your system will be very dry. So you'll probably also want to add some other of the green or wet ingredients that are wetter than the poo. Excuse me. The next uh, letter in our acronym, Adam, is air. You just gonna have to hold on a sec, sweetie. Um, so air is oxygen, and you're wanting to keep that system aerobic. So it's the bacteria that operate in a high oxygenated system that actually uh, really helps. Uh, break things down and break it down quickly. As soon as you get the other bacteria, the anaerobic bacteria, that's when it gets really smelly. So oxygenating things, and again, when I'm outside, I'll show you a tool that can be used to oxygenate a system. Um, but yeah, any, any way that you can get air down in there is really helpful. And then of course, moisture is our other fundamental element. Um, you want it to be moist enough, but not sloppy. Uh, if it's too dry, not a lot will happen. And if it's too wet, you're going to lose a lot of that oxygen through compaction and it's going to stink. So um, just watching your mo moisture level, um, and it might mean adding some wet leaves, adding some dry leaves, adding some wet cardboard, adding some dry cardboard, something like that is going to really help you balance your system. Uh, and then our ANT acronym is amount. When you're feeding worms, it's very easy to overfeed them. In an in-ground system like the one I've shown you earlier, what I should have shown you is it's pollen. <laughs> so the worms can come and go. Um, they, if there's too much food in there, they'll just, it, it'll start to rot, but they'll move out and still be safe. Uh, if there's not enough food in there, obviously their population's not gonna keep growing. So you just wanna think about managing your amount of food. Um, but when it comes to cat and dog poo, it's probably less of an issue because you're using a slightly different system. Our next one on the uh, acronym is neutrality, which is your pH scale. So worm farms need to be, okay, <laughs> worm farms need to be fairly pH neutral. Um, and you'll find usually with pet poo, it tends to be a bit on the alkaline side. Um, and so you might want to neutralize that with um, some other additives. So you might want to throw in, you know, some scraps from offcuts from your tomatoes, from your salad or something um, can, can help bring that pH back to neutral. And of course, temperature. Worms like dogs in cars and, and us um, will cook <laughs> in really hot temperatures. So um, they tend to like temperatures similar to us. Again, if you're using an enclosed in-ground system like the ones I've shown you today, um, you don't really have to worry about temperature. If you are composting traditional style, obviously you're needing a hot temperature. So just keeping in mind that um, there are different needs for different systems. Um, and, and it's mostly if you're having a, an above ground worm farm, that's sort of separate where the worms can't escape down into the ground, then, uh, then temperature can be a little bit of an issue. All right, to bag or not to bag, that is the question. Um, now I have an example here. I wish I could pass this around so you could all feel it. This is a home compostable bag. There are lots of different types of bags. There's obviously plastic bags, which have to go to landfill. Then there's degradable bags which still have to go to landfill. Degradable don't actually biodegrade. So biodegradable means they will break down in the environment. I can't talk right now, sweetie. Um, <laughs> Three-year-old knows better. You, you can talk to me, mummy. You're not talking to all these people. Um, so it needs to be certified 
home compostable if you're going to be composting those bags at home. A lot of compostable plastics, they aren't actually plastic, they mimic plastic. Um, they will compost, but in a commercial environment that gets really hot. Um, in a home compost system, it's a lot more limited because it's generally a cold system. So it must be certifiable home compostable. Um, but my other tip is minimize it. The more of those bags you put in, the slower your system is going to be. They do, take, even though they're home compostable, something like this in a worm farm will still take months, months and months and months. Oh, so you um you definitely need to minimise how much you're putting in there and perhaps putting in some sort of an, another activator to speed up your system if, um, if you are using bags. So my recommendation would be if you're out and about walking your dog, take a compostable bag, but at home, just use, I think I've got another slide that shows you lots of examples. Um, just use some sort of a little picker-upper. <laughs> this is a little plastic picker-upper, um, a glove, which of course ideally is a reusable glove, um, but not a porous glove. So you want something like a rubber glove. Um, that, that's got a plastic bag on it, but there's little tools that you can use for picking up. And of course, tools, same as this, um, just to minimize the amount of those compostable plastics. And of course, um, another thing that you can do instead of plastic, which um, I didn't mention on the last slide, is newspaper, of course. So you can line a little bucket with newspaper. Um, and as you're walking your dog, some people even walk their cats, um, you can pop that, you know, the, the poo into the little bucket that's lined with newspaper. So you're not always having to wash that bucket. In terms of kitty litter, there's a lot of different kitty litters on the market. If you're wanting to compost your pet poo, your cat poo, um, you don't want to be using something synthetic um, or something that you really wouldn't want in the environment. So I would stay away from things like these crystals. Um, any of the palletized um, ones are pretty good, but what you'll find is the palletized uh, cardboard, or sorry, the palletized newspaper ones will break down a lot quicker than the palletized sawdust ones. Um, obviously because newspaper is going to break down quicker than wood, sawdust, it's been more processed already. Um, there are clumping clays and things which whilst they're natural, they're not really going to do you any favours in the compost system. So again, I'd probably stay away from those. Um, but of course, you as you're picking up your cat litter, or your cat faeces, particularly the poo, um, you can usually isolate the poo with a little, um, the little scooper has holes in it. So it's easy to isolate the poo. It's when you're emptying out the actual, the whole litter tray, because you've got all the urine in there as well. Um, you're going you're to have a lot of very alkaline uh, material going into your system. So that's when I would be uh, adding, uh, oh gosh, I think watermelon would probably be really good. So adding some other food scraps, um, even though you're not going to be using the compost for growing things, you want to add some things that are going to offset that heavy carbon, heavy alkaline mass. Otherwise, again, you're just going to end up with a mass that every time you lift the lid, is just going to have that ammonia smell and not really do anything. So you need to break that up. Think a little bit like making a cake. You add your dry ingredients, you add your wet ingredients, you add your sweet ingredients, you add a bit of salt. You need a mixture of ingredients for the magic to happen. If you were just to add flour, you're not going to get a cake. So think about that with adding things, um, particularly when you're adding your kitty litter, um, but just in general in your pet food system. How are we going for time? Oh, we're good. We're going really good for time. Okay, so where to get supplies? Um, so council has a program, a compost community, Mornington Peninsula's compost community program, where you can get all these sorts of systems um, discounted. So, so um, obviously you've probably got a lot of stuff laying around in the shed or in the garage that you probably don't even think about. Um, there's a lot of materials there that you could use to make a compost system, um, like an in-ground system. Um, of course, the tip shop, um, people are always throwing stuff out and you'll get some amazing materials at the tip shop, particularly things like polypipe. Oh, I'm puffed now after running. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, it's been a really tough year COVID wise for small business. So I'd recommend um, if you are going to go down the shop to buy something, 
look to support. Yeah, sweetie, <laughs> look at supporting a, a small family owned business rather than a big multi million dollar corporation that's um, they've all done really well during COVID. So, you know, you give someone in the community a bit of a boost up and help them as well. Some other resources um, on Compost Community, which is um, the website with the council program. There's a pet poo page, which I'm always updating with different pet poo information um, and lots of other free downloads in terms of ingredients. So there's, you know, a poster of greens and browns um, and that sort of thing. And of course, the Facebook group is an interactive place for questions and chat. Um, just look up Compost Community Members AU. And there's also a page as well. Um, but the chat's really useful because we've got everyone on there from beginners through to um, we've got one guy who's been doing advanced composting for decades and he's such a wealth of knowledge uh, and he tends to jump on and answer everybody's questions so it's a really really good resource if you've got even a really curly question um, that needs a bit of research it's a really good place so you can go and get that kind of information um, so whilst we have time for questions, I've got my details down the bottom. I'm just going to take the laptop outside so that I can show you just the size of some of the bigger in-ground systems. Um, but then I will open it up to questions. I'm just looking, it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat just yet, but I probably can't tell while I'm sharing my screen. So I'm just going to buzz my background so you don't get dizzy as I walk. And we will just go outside. Okay. Break. Okay. Now we'll unblur. to speak of you or gallery view so that you can see more as well. So, so that I'm not in the way, which way do I need to turn? This way. <laughs> so this is an example of one of the in-ground systems, um, but one of the larger scale ones. I've not actually buried this in the ground just yet, um, but it, so it has a section at the bottom, lift it up so you can see it. With the holes, don't find the ground. Lever. You don't actually have to touch anything. Um, so it's yeah, basically just like a um, you know, a pedal bin in the house. So it's a really handy way for composting a lot of things hands free. Now with um, with a system like that, where where I want to put that, there's a lot of rocks in the ground. It's actually really hard to dig. So I'll actually end up putting a little raised garden bed in and then sitting it in the raised garden bed. So whilst we're pretty lucky on the peninsula, whilst we're pretty lucky on the peninsula with, um, you know, nice sandy soils that are quite easy to dig, there's, um, you know, there's always patches that are quite heavy clay. So if you find it is just too hard to dig, you could put in a raised garden bed and pop your Pop your little in-ground system in like that, and then just plant ornamentals around the outside. <laughs> now, this is a compost aerator turning tool. Um, so these are really handy for your in-ground systems, particularly if you find with the cat poo, or sorry, not so much the cat poo, but the cat litter. If you're finding that it's getting quite compacted and just smelling it's a really good idea to get in and turn it over. So you just basically take your lid off, screw that down like a corkscrew and lift it up and just keep using that to turn it. Um, and that's a, a really, really easy way to get air in there, to mix your ingredients and to get the magic happening really quickly. So I'm just going to close my background again so you don't get dizzy while I walk or sit back inside. And I will go to your questions. We all know it, so you don't see all my mess, don't we? <laughs> Oh, 
All right. Um, so in terms of questions, you're welcome to either pop things into the chat if you don't want to speak or um, you can unmute yourself. Um, you're welcome to turn on your video if you like as well and yeah, ask away. I don't think we have any questions, Amy. Let me see. There she is. Amy? Yeah, in the background. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions, then I suppose it's a early finish for us. Oh, one question for Laura. Um, she missed a bit about avoiding pathogens. Could you just quickly do a recount? Oh, wow. Okay, that was most of it, I think. <laughs> um, so, so dog and cat food have a lot of pathogens. Um, there's in cat poo there's toxoplasmosis which can cause birth defects um even just you know salmonella and e coli e coli e coli um uh, you know in um in dog and cat poo so you don't want to yeah keeping it hot yes yeah, so you don't want to be using that on your veggies to grow because obviously you know salmonella and e coli can end up in your veggies as well so um yeah just having a separate system keeping it away from your uh, any food growing areas uh, and safe handling. So yes, keeping it hot is one option. So either compost it really hot um, to kill the pathogens, which is really hard to achieve because it, you need to maintain a really hot temperature for many days. And uh, the other way is with these in-ground systems that are separate. So um, keeping them separate so that you don't uh, oh, yep, yeah, doing this while at work. That's okay. Totally understand. I'm doing this while I'm at, while I'm mothering. <laughs> um, yeah, having the separate system that you don't have to harvest means a lot less handling. So, um, you know, the pathogens are contained. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to put in the chat box the um, link to Compost Community where you can get access to the rebates that's currently available. So at the moment, it is all residents are available, uh, eligible sorry, for one $50 rebate per household. Um, and so with that rebate, you can pick and choose which system that you um, is best for your house, your, um, your household. So for example, if you're already composting and you're looking at expanding and looking at um, composting your pet waste, then perhaps you can use that rebate for that purpose. Or if you need another system, um, then you can also um, buy a couple more if you want as well. And you can also mix and match um, to include like the cashew grains or um, compost toners. Um, yeah, so there's a vast variety of options that's available to residents through the website. Um, so question for Valerie. So I need something fairly big that even for one cat, if I want to add the cat litter, so, like, what would you recommend for, like, a bigger system? Yeah, so, well, there's so many different systems on the market. Um, so that one that we looked at outside, the yard art, they're huge. Um, that's more than adequate. You'd be wanting to add a lot of other scraps to that as well. Um, and <laughs> I'm not eating plastic food, darling, thank you. Um, otherwise, you can have a few in tandem. So you can actually have, like, three of a bit too close to the camera. <laughs> Three of these in a row underground. Um, so you can just have multiple small systems as another way to do it. And that's often a bit easier to manage. Um, or you could build a big compost bay that you're going to get running really hot. So yeah, it sort of depends on what else you're wanting to compost, um, how much space you have. And um, yeah, what, um, what your budget is. Yeah, so for example, um, if you wanted to get the yard art in Grand Road Farm, which is the, the big system that um, Alice showed us in her yard, then um, at the moment they, with the member discount, because we're a member with Compost Community, it's $185 when it retails for $230, but then with the $50 rebate on top of that, it comes to $145, and that includes delivery as well. So all the transactions are made online, and then it'll get shipped to you, or if you want, um, then 
Um, you can also pick it up from Ella. She's in Lanbrong, so not too far um, from us as well. Um, and I think if but there's no other questions. I'm just having a quick chat check to see if anyone's come through the email to say that they're missing or we're looking to join. There's no. Um, so but, so then let's um, wrap it up and have an, an early um, session and so we can enjoy a bit of the sunshine while it's out. So I just wanted to thank everyone for coming along today and sharing a bit of their Saturday with us. Thanks for, and thanks for persevering with us to working from home. Um, and thanks to Ella um, for um, sharing some of your knowledge as well. Um, as Ella said, that after today's session, um, she'll send through the link to the video uh, recording and the slides. So then I'll share that around um, to everyone as well. And so then it also has the links to the Facebook group um, page. That's um, really handy. Um, it also, yeah, it's often that other people in the community may have already even like gone through something similar that you're also trying to um, troubleshoot. So it's always handy to have that on um, hand as an additional resource. In addition to either counsel as well, you're welcome to get in contact with us for any questions. And and if we don't know anything, then we'll also pass it on to Ella because um, Ella's just full of great knowledge um, and always helpful. So yeah, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your um, weekend. Okay, bye. Thank you. <laughs> And if you do have any sort of fleeting last minute questions that you just, yeah, you know, quickly um, forgot to ask, then feel free to pop us a message. But yeah, jump on the Facebook group because there's a whole possible people really ready to help. All right, I shall end. See you later, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.